I have finally managed to get my hands on Vivo's latest ultimate flagship smartphone, the Vivo X90 Pro Plus. There was no Plus version last year in the X80 lineup, so it's good to see that Vivo aren't holding back any punches this time around. The global launch of the X90 series will be happening soon, but as far as I can tell, the Plus variant will remain a China exclusive, and it starts at around 900 US dollars, which isn't exactly cheap, but trust me when I say it's worth every cent. We're talking about huge improvements in the camera department, which packs in four rear sensors, and one of them is no doubt Sony's massive 50 megapixel IMX 989 one inch main camera sensor. The X90 Pro Plus also sports a vegan leather water resistant design, houses the new TSMC made Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 chipset, upgraded Vivo V2 ISP chip, faster LPDDR5X RAM, next gen UFS 4.0 storage, a larger cooling system, and more. Can Vivo's latest top tier flagship dethrone all other one inch camera sensor smartphones? And if so, will it be able to stand out in terms of all other aspects? Let's find out in my full review of the Vivo X90 Pro Plus. The X90 Pro Plus comes in two main color variants. Mine being the China red vegan leather version, or you can pick up the same vegan leather, but in original black. It looks absolutely phenomenal and is a breeze to hold, not to mention that super soft touch and all the branding around it looks fantastic, which still remains when you pop on that vegan leather case in the box, matches the color as well as all the different logos and branding. There might be a bit too much branding and logos around the device on its back plate, but I actually think it makes it stand out more. I do like the circle camera that we have at the back as we've seen from many flagships in the past year. And inside the device sits a 4,700 milliamp hour battery, as well as 80 watt wire charging and 50 watt wireless charging. We also get the latest Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 chipset, Adreno 740 integrated GPU, LPDDR5X RAM, UFS 4.0 storage, a massive vapor chamber liquid cooling system, dual SIM 5G, Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.3 and NFC. We have that wonderful vegan leather touch on the back plate, and we do have protection on the display, though it's not Gorilla Glass, and we of course have wonderful aluminum frames wrapping around the build in almost like a gunmetal like silver. It is IP68 dust and water resistant, just like its predecessor. It is quite hefty at 221 grams in weight and 9.7 millimeters in thickness. And when it comes to the camera system, we have an identical 48 megapixel IMX598 ultra wide sensor, which we saw on its predecessor, the X. 80 Pro. Things start to change up when we move on to the telephoto camera, that being a 50.3 megapixel IMX758 portrait telephoto lens. And then of course we also have an upgraded periscope telephoto camera for those long zoomed shots with an optical zoom range of 3.5 times. But the most impressive sensor at the back of this device is no doubt that 50.3 megapixel Sony IMX989 one inch camera sensor. And though it's similar to other devices that use the same sensor, it does have a much wider aperture. Not to mention we also have a DTOF laser autofocusing system, all cameras have been coated with Zeiss T, and we also have Vivo's latest V2 image signal processing chip. When it comes to Zeiss branding, we do have Zeiss natural color on and off, and you can use it within the ultra wide cameras as well as the main and the two telephotos, one being a regular telephoto and the other one being periscope. And it does an okay job with Zeiss color on, it kind of gives it a natural look, but with it off, it's more vivid. I guess you could say more Samsung-like, more user-friendly for social media platforms, I guess you could say. So from here on out, we're gonna be sticking to Zeiss natural color off throughout the remainder of reviewing the camera sensors over here. As you can see with it off, it just makes me pop a little bit more than when it is enabled. We have one times portrait mode using the main sensor over here, as well as two times portrait mode. And with two times portrait mode or any of the portrait modes for that matter, we actually have around six different Zeiss styles. They say styles instead of filters. We have cinematic mode, which looks pretty great, as well as cine flare, which actually looks better at nice. We can also take portraits at 3.5 times using the periscope, and we do have a double exposure mode, which looks awesome. We also have Zeiss e doff mode, which makes it more realistic in terms of portrait. We also have a miniature effect, which for the life of me, I couldn't get right. And we do have Zeiss APC, which actually tilts the photo if you get the angle wrong to correct it, which does a more than decent job. We have macro mode over here, which 
actually takes pleasing results with the ultra wide sensor. And moving on to the ultra wide sensor, we have 48 megapixel native, we can bin it down, 41 binning to 12 megapixels. We can do the same with the main from 50.3 megapixels down to 12.58 megapixels and it looks absolutely fantastic thanks to that one inch sensor. We also have two times optical zoom thanks to the first telephoto which we can take at native and bin down resolution. And the periscope can shoot at native 64 megapixel at 3.5 times optical zoom or bin down to almost 16 megapixels. Then the periscope continues the trend and takes all the digital zoom shots all the way up to 100 times zoom. And they look pretty good, I would say up to about 50 times digital zoom. As soon as we hit 70 times, it starts to get a bit wonky and 100 times is not really viewable, I guess you could say. We can record 4K 30 FPS and automatically switch from ultra wide to main to telephoto to periscope cameras over here and it does a seamless job, but that is capped at 30 FPS but we can record 4K 60 FPS without changing the lenses, of course, on the ultra wide side of things, and it looks absolutely fantastic. Moving on to 4K 60 FPS main video using that wonderful one inch sensor size. Because of the larger aperture, it's actually bringing in more light and making things pop more in terms of color as opposed to other one inch camera sensor phones using the same lens. And we do have a Dolby Vision video, which you can record on 4K 60 FPS main video. 8K 30 FPS is a bit wonky since stabilization is not allowed to be used in this mode, but 8K still looks nice, crisp and clear. And shooting 8K 30 FPS when you're taking a non-portrait video of me looks fantastic. Once again, all of these are not portrait modes. I'm just using the regular video modes and because of that large one inch sensor, it gives a very awesome natural bokeh in the background, does a great job. Though we do have Zeiss cinematic portrait mode, but because we already got such a wonderful natural bokeh from the main sensor anyway, we don't really need to use these portrait modes per se. And we can use something called micro movie portrait mode. There's a whole bunch of different filters and no, it's not shot in 4K like it says on there. It's actually shot at 1080p. We do have 1080p 240 FPS slow motion video and the highest FPS we have is 480 FPS slow-mo. Though there's quite a crop in factor and this is capping at 720p resolution. And when recording video with stabilization mode off. It's pretty unbearable. It's very wonky and shaky, even at 4K 60 FPS main video. We do have standard stabilization, though there is a crop. In fact, it is extremely stable, pretty much the only stabilization mode you need to use on this device. Though we do have ultra stabilization mode, which is capped at 1080p and 60 FPS. It does a great job. And we do have super anti-shake video pro mode, which is also 1080p 60, but utilizes the ultra wide camera. The only thing that can do horizon leveling stabilization is also the ultra wide, but capped at 30 FPS, 1080p. Does a great job and shooting ultra wide video at night at 30 fps reverts to 24 fps because i guess you could say a bit of a night mode kicks in but ultra wide at night even with 30 fps mode does not look good 60 fps mode is pretty much unusable with the ultra wide camera all you see is pitch black and you'll see in a sec when we shift over to the main sensor how much brighter it actually is 4k 60 even at 60 fps using the main sensor because of that large aperture on the one inch imx 989 sensor it is a lot brighter and shooting at 24 fps 4k video with the main sensor it literally makes everything that was not visible, completely visible at night, which is absolutely fantastic. We can also film 8K 30 FPS main video at night. No night mode options, no stability mode over here. It's pretty dark as well. I wouldn't say as bad as when we shot ultra wide earlier. Night mode off with the ultra wide looks okay. Night mode on, it gets a lot brighter, but loses a lot of detail. Night mode off here using the main looks great as is. Night mode on, I wouldn't say is the best. Once again, it just kind of washes everything out. Now, when we start to zoom in, it does not use the telephoto or the periscope at two or 3.5 times digital zoom. And you'll see again over here, ultra wide night mode off and night mode on, brightens things up, loses a lot of detail. Night mode off over here and then night mode on on the main. Once again, washes it out a bit. I wouldn't say this is the best night mode. The camera system on the back of this is amazing, but it cannot use the telephoto or periscope when taking night photos, even if night mode is off. And you'll see as we go to start zooming in further, but ultra wide again with night mode on looks great. Main with night mode off looks honestly the best and night mode on brightens things up a bit. In this shot, it actually does more than less. And when we shift over to two times zoom, it's not optical, it's digital and 3.5 is the same with night mode off or on, doesn't use the telephoto or periscope like I mentioned so many times. I feel like I have to keep repeating myself even at 10 times digital zoom. We're still not using the periscope, but at 30 times, the periscope finally kicks in with night mode off or on, and the night mode options here don't actually make a difference at all. 
it's it's not night and day it's it's night and night there's no difference whatsoever even all the way up to a hundred times digital zoom using the periscope sensor now we can take a long exposure shot so i kind of just moved my hand here it looks pretty great and astro mode is absolutely phenomenal we also have super moon mode here at 1x you can't do ultra wide with it and though it looks fantastic and the telephoto and periscopes are used the moon actually looks a bit unrealistic and 10 times digital zoom using the periscope actually looks a bit more cropped out as opposed to 3.5 times zoom but that's because it's blurring everything else out and just focusing on the moon 100 times looks Pretty decent, all the details actually there. Night mode off and night mode on in terms of just taking a photo of me at night, looks great. We do have night mode options for portrait, which is the first I've seen and it does a more than decent job. We can also use the Cine Flare mode at 1x portrait, which looks great. And you can enable night mode and it changes it up a bit. Do have two times portrait mode, night mode off and night mode on. Once again, brightens the shot up a bit. Really nice natural bokeh in the background and we can do the same with 3.5 times zoom with night mode off or on using the periscope. The camera sensors on the back of the Vivo X90 Pro Plus leave me with very little to complain about. Every single sensor does the job as intended. I guess the only thing I have a bit of a caveat about with this device is the fact that when you take photos at night, it does not utilize the telephoto or periscope sensors where the night mode is off or on until you hit 30 times zoom, which is a bit of a bummer. And the fact that the Zeiss color mode hasn't been tweaked enough is a bit disappointing. Maybe that will get fixed with the global launch, but overall videos are incredible, photos are incredible, and the whole camera system as an entire package is just phenomenal. I'm not sure if there's many phones out there that can get much better than this. On the right side of the device, we have a power button. Above that, a non-split volume rocker. At the bottom, we have a dual SIM 5G tray. Unfortunately, no expandable storage, though there is a wonderful blue water resistant seal. Nice little touch over there. We do have USB 3.2 Type-C port at the bottom. Alongside that is the first dual stereo speaker. One at the bottom, one at the top inside the earpiece, both paired up with Super Audio, Vivo's take on Dolby Atmos, I guess you could say. And we have an IR blaster on top. And underneath that earpiece sits a punch hole 24 millimeter selfie camera, which has a 32 megapixel resolution, exactly the same one that we saw on the X80 Pro. And because of the new processing of the phone, photos actually come out a little bit better than last year, whether you're taking regular selfie or portrait selfie or using five different Zeiss styles over here. Edge detection is on point with most of the styles. It is absolutely perfect with the regular portrait mode. We do have the cinematic mode as well and taking just that regular portrait just looks absolutely phenomenal in terms of clarity and background blur. Not to mention, we do have natural portrait mode at 1080p 30fps, which is the cap for portrait video, even when you use the Zeiss cinematic portrait mode, it is capped at 30fps, unfortunately, and it is quite wonky, it's not very stabilized. Though if you want the cinematic effect, you can still record 1080p 60fps selfie video when you enable movie mode. What's up guys, this is Technic recording a 1080p 60fps selfie video on the brand new Vivo X90 Pro Plus. Unfortunately it's capped at 1080p but at least we get 60 FPS selfie video recording. Let me know what you think about the video quality as well as the mic quality when recording with the selfie cam. Now it is quite wonky with stabilization off and that is out the box. There's no stabilization because when you kick in steady face, it crops in by an insane amount. It's a lot more stable but it's really hard to capture your face with steady face on even at night and night videos with the selfie camera do not come out the best. A little bit brighter, but very wonky with 1080p 30fps selfie video with stabilization off and once again a reverse to 24fps. And we do have 1080p 60fps selfie video, no stabilization over here. It looks okay while I'm walking around, but using 1080p 60fps in a slightly more lit up situation does an okay job especially if you're not walking around and 1080p 30 is pretty much the sweet spot for selfie video recording at night. And we do have natural portrait mode, which once again looks better than I was expecting even at night. Taking selfie photos at night with night mode off looks great as is. Night mode on brightens up my face and gives more detail to the background. Flash mode off with the portrait looks great and flash mode on once again gives me more of a natural look. So the selfies on the Vivo X90 Pro Plus are not as good as its back cams, which is what I always say when a phone has an incredible back camera setup, but its selfie camera is lacking. It's what I said about the Xiaomi 13 Pro because that camera is just very questionable. But what they've done here is they've taken the same sensor as last year and they've improved it with post-processing 
and the results that come after you take the footage, photos or videos actually come out better than when you are recording or taking photos with it. It does a better job than I was expecting considering it's the same sensor. It's not gonna be the perfect camera in terms of selfies for vloggers out there if you wanna record on the go, but it's gonna do the job perfectly fine. Powering on the device and getting to that wonderful always, always on display. It has a few motion always on displays as well. We have that wonderful Qualcomm 3D Sonic Max fingerprint sensor. It takes just 0.2 seconds to unlock and is nine times larger than the ultrasonic Gen 2. It is absolutely massive and to register your finger, it just takes one tap. It is my favorite thing about this phone. We also have 2D face unlock, which utilizes the selfie camera. It has a nice little animation spin around the selfie camera over there, which is about the best thing it has going for it. And we do have a 6.78 inch LTPO 4.0 E6 AMOLED display. It is a curved display with an aspect ratio of 20 by nine, and it is 1.07 billion colors with 10 bit colors, supports HDR 10 plus and Dolby Vision content, and hits a peak brightness of 1,800 nits, which is one of the brightest panels I've ever seen. It has 1440 Hertz PWM dimming, which is a huge improvement over last year's 362 that we saw on the X80 Pro. And yes, we have that wonderful WQHD plus resolution with 517 pixels per inch. Not to mention we have one to 120 Hertz LTPO 4.0 tech in this guy, and we can adjust every single individual app to choose which one we want running at 60, which one we want running at 120. I'm using a Fluid app over here and we're sitting at 120 hertz, it's super fluid. Not to mention we stick to the same touch sampling rates as last year, which is 300 hertz. We are kitted with Origin OS 3 this time around, skinned over Android 13, and apparently we have 48 months of anti-aging, so the software is not gonna be slowed down within a four year period. We can merge and unmerge different components on our home screen. We can also tap on different cubes to change what happens when you touch edges of the device. And we can also go to the mood cube where we can adjust the colors as well as the shapes of our control center. We can also change the icons, whether we want text under them or not, the size of them, all just from the home screen, which is awesome. We also have different window styles so that you can see the weather on any wallpaper that you set as well as the time based on where the sun is sitting during the day as well as other themes that you can choose from. We also have widgets that you can interact with and you can tap on and see your screen on time. There's just so much going for it. You can change the colors of each folder and you can make large folders. You can adjust the size of those large folders to a vertical, horizontal three or just one huge nine or three by three folder. And when you enlarge it, you can tap directly on that icon, something that was missing from last year's Origin OS updates. And it is here now and I absolutely love I'm so happy to see all Android devices sticking with this now going forward. Thanks to Huawei that is. And moving on to other things that you can customize in the control center, we also have different focus mode options, much like we've seen from iOS devices. And that does a pretty great job. And much like we see from iOS, we now have battery health within the settings. A first for Android devices. We do have Google services built straight into the phone. So if you pick up this China only model, you'll be happy to know that you just have to install a Play Store APK. We can shift to mini windows, pin mini windows to the side, and we can even drag them up to the top and create a split window where you can open up another app and then you can adjust which one you want larger and which one you want smaller. You can also add a shortcut to the home screen, close that split window dual app that you have opened and then reopen it later on if you tend to use many different apps in split screen. And we can have a mini window and shift it over to small to mini window and have our split apps in the background as well. We can also change how things look in terms of our recent apps. And of course, if we remove all that and get to the haptics, which are absolutely fantastic up there with the best of the best. Not to mention, we do have those wonderful dual stereo speakers that we have super audio and no Dolby Atmos this time around. How does it stack up against some of the best sounding smartphones around?
When we get to gaming, we do have an ultra game mode overlay where we can open up small windows such as Chrome, put it to the side, close it up. We also have view enhancement mode and game boost mode and the wonderful V2 chip, which apparently shares half the workload of the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 chipset. And starting here with Genshin Impact, highest possible graphics, max FPS, we got an average FPS of 59, which matches the Xiaomi 13 Pro with the same chipset, though it did get a lower min and a lower max FPS. It was still on average exactly the same, which is good to see and it didn't get quite as hot as the Xiaomi which is once again a notable point. On Real Racing 3 we can actually hit 120 FPS on average with a min of 119, max of 120. This was capped on any other Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 phone I've tested thus far. Obviously this will change with more releases going forward and with Call of Duty Mobile we were able to get a rock solid 90 FPS. It did dip now and then but it was sitting at 90 FPS most of the time with low graphics and ultra FPS. This was once again capped on the Xiaomi device that I tested out last week and moving Moving on to our next app, our next game that is being Bullet Force Ultra Graphics Max FPS. This is the only game I actually encountered where it was capping at 60 FPS. Hopefully this gets support before the global launch of the X90 series. But overall, I'm very happy with gaming performance. Now moving on to the actual hardware, we do have 12 gigs of LPDDR5X RAM, which can be extended by an additional eight gigs of RAM, bringing it up to a total of 20 gigs. And we have that wonderful Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 octa-core CPU which is streaks ahead of its predecessor. And yes, it is indeed manufactured by TSMC. And we have boost performance mode this time around. And using that and the new chipset, we got an Antutu score of 1,291,420 points, which beats every other Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 chipset I have personally tested. When it comes to Geekbench, the only device that beat it was the iPhone, but honestly not by that much, especially when it comes to multi-core performance. It beat the other two Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 powered devices I have tested. And last and certainly not least, testing out graphics performance, the Vivo X90 Pro Plus got a whopping score of 3770 with an average FPS of 22.6 on Wildlife Extreme, which renders at 4K. It's good to see Androids finally stepping up their game. So I guess it's safe to say that no other Android can touch the Vivo X90 Pro Plus in terms of performance, thanks to its new V2 chip, mixed up with the almighty Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 chipset. It is packed to the brim in terms of software and features, which in all honesty can be a bit overwhelming at times. It has an eye-watering display, which is now brighter and now packs in higher 1440 Hertz PWM dimming, which should minimize those watery eyes. It takes some of the best photos and and videos I have ever seen and checks all the right boxes in terms of performance, cooling, battery, charging, design, and even water resistance. The Vivo X90 Pro Plus will certainly make other brands sweat for the remainder of the year, but does it have what it takes to remain king? Let me know your thoughts on Vivo's latest premium flagship smartphone in the comment section down below. This is TechNeck and I'll catch you in the next one.